help me welcome Mark Lindquist. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, my friends. You know, I've got this great life these days. You know, I'm 34 years old, and in my fortunate career, I've been lucky enough to say that, that I'm an actor, that I'm a world touring entertainer, that I've had the good fortune to perform live in 22 countries and 44 states for over a million people throughout my career. And through all those adventures, man, I got all kinds of great stories. I could tell you stories about acting on Lost and singing in the same karaoke bar as Daniel Day Kim. I can tell you stories about being on set with Hawaii Five-0 and, and I was off camera, we were at the craft services table and I'm standing next to Alex O'Loughlin who plays Detective Steve McGarrett and I say, Alex, will you just, will you just for me, will you just say, book him Dano, just for me, right? <laughs> I can tell you all kinds of great stories about filming Universal Studios movie Battleship and I'm out there swimming in the Pacific Ocean and, and I pulled Rihanna out of the ocean with this hand, with this hand right here, right? and I haven't washed it since, right? Man, I can tell you all kinds of great stories. I can tell you stories about, about uh, being in the United States military, serving an overnight shift. I'm working 3 a.m. I'm, I'm sitting at my desk. It's 3 a.m. My colonel sneaks up behind me. My name is Sergeant Lindquist, and he says, Lindquist, wake up. Yes, sir. No, sir. Right away, sir. We get done with our conversation, and I hear my flight chief say to the colonel, uh, sir, he's not sleeping. He's just Asian. I can tell you stories. We're speaking from Microsoft, some big conference, and afterwards at the reception, uh, we're there in a room like this, and this guy comes up to me and says, Mark, great job. I really enjoyed your speech. You know, I, I thank you for sharing. But I got to tell you, people have been coming up to me all night long telling me congratulations. Because apparently us Asians look alike to all you white people. You know, CEOs call me up and they say, hey, Mark, my people, my people need what you've got. They need your energy. They need your excitement. They need your enthusiasm. They need to know that here at my organization, at our team, in our company, that they get to live a life doing the things that they love. Just like you when you're out there on the road doing your thing as a singer and a performer. My people need passion. So we teach this concept of a life filled with passion based on a book that we've written called Passion, Eight Steps to Reignite Yours. And we go through this step-by-step -step process of, of what it is to reignite your passion that brought you into the career field you're in in the first place. We teach these steps like step number three, find your strength zone. And we spend some time diving into the things that they need to focus on, maybe the things that they need to collaborate on and delegate. Step number five, don't stop until you find your passion. You see, that's the part about resiliency and determination and grit and stick to itiveness. That's the part where we, we plant our flag, where we draw a line in the sand and we say, you know what? For me and for my people at our organization and our team, we're not going to stop until we find this passion. Then we can join arms and we can move forward and take our organization to the next level. Step number eight, we talk about everything is possible. Now we're expanding our horizons. We're elevating our thinking to what could be possible in our life and for our organization. We're dreaming big. We're talking about JFK man on the moon type dreams. We're talking about believing like the Wright brothers believed that man flight was possible. See, because everything is possible for the passionate person. You see, I believe that, that passion is not just for the young people. It's not just for the kiddos. It's for everybody. It's as applicable for the young professional who is navigating their way through the workforce for the first time as it is the mid-level professional who needs to reignite that spark for what they do. It's as applicable for the CEO who needs to teach these steps to their people so that they can reignite their own passion. Passion is as applicable for the retiree who is now trying to reinvent themselves in an unfamiliar and uncharted waters. Passion is even applicable for the person that's going into the nursing home and is now a little bit frightened and unsure about the future that lies ahead. This passion thing is for everybody. I believe that passion is most uh, accurately illustrated by a principle my father used to teach me. Gordon Lindquist used to say, and it's a lot like Stephen Covey's principle of begin with the end in mind. Dad said, hey, Mark, I know what you want to be when you grow up. 
I said, Dad, what's that? He said, Mark, here's the deal. I, you want to be at the end of your life looking back at the years that you've lived, and you want to be sitting in a rocking chair on the front porch. And you got all the neighborhood kids gathered around you, and they say, Uncle Mark, Grandpa Mark, tell me about life. Dad says, you never want to have to sit in that chair and look those kids in the eye and say, I wish I would have. What you want to be is you want to be sitting on that front porch at the end of your life looking back at the years that you've lived and you want to say, hey kids, gather round. Let me tell you the tale of adventure about the time that I'm glad I did. That's what you want to be. It's a talk called Passion, Eight Steps to Reignite Yours. One of the other things that we speak about is service and giving back in community and volunteerism in your life's work. I teach a principle that Magic Johnson once taught me when I was 17 years old. Of all the things that Magic could have taught us, he said to us, kids, a life well lived is a life spent giving back to those who have given so much to you. This principle of a life meant serving others, lived to serve others. I tell stories about my father who was in the Peace Corps and gave that example to me, my stay-at-home mother on a farm. See, I grew up in a small town. Anybody familiar with the town I grew up in? It's called the booming metropolis of Ortonville, Minnesota. <laughs> Population 2000. And Ortonville, you know, you, you know towns like Ortonville. Ortonville's one of those towns with one gas station and, 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 and one grocery store, and when the Dairy Queen came to town, woo, that's a big deal. <laughs> I talk about growing up in a small town, living a life, contributing to the lives of others. It's called service, my way of life. The final topic we speak about is gratitude. And I tell that story and teach that principle like this. I was sitting in a boardroom in southeast Washington, D.C., when all of a sudden, the windows shook. We sent somebody out into the hallway to see what was the matter, and, and, and they came back with nothing to report. The meeting broke for the morning coffee break, and we went out into the hallway, and I saw two of my colleagues, and they were hugging, and they were crying. I walked a few steps further, and I saw one of my colleagues on the telephone, and they were crying too, because this was the morning of Tuesday. September 11th of 2001. I was stationed in Washington, D.C. with an AmeriCorps group. We were attached to an American Red Cross disaster action team. And for the days and weeks following 9-11, we were deployed to the uh, Ground Zero at the Pentagon and, and, and worked there as an emergency support worker. And I teach, you know, we've all got this shared experience. We all remember where we were on 9-11, just like my father remembers where he was when Kennedy was shot. I take this shared experience and I teach gratitude. I teach about being thankful for the things that we have. So I teach a principle that I call the best person that you have ever been. Because I believe that the best person that you and I have ever been is the person we were on 9-12-2001. On that day, we called our mother and we told her that we loved her. We hugged our kids a little tighter that night. You see, on 9-12-2001, I believe we were the best version of ourselves we've ever been. We were the most caring, kind, compassionate, loving, giving, patient person we have ever been. We had more gratitude, and we were more thankful for the things and the people in our life than we have ever been. And that's a talk that we call gratitude. Live it. You see, my friends, I, I know what's going to happen. I know what's going to happen is, is you've come here today to this beautiful hotel and location and, the, and you've enjoyed the, the wonderful speakers that Nationally Speaking has put in front of you and you're going to be in your office tomorrow and you're going to have your program there and you're going to say, man, I just, I feel, I feel on fire for life because of the things I heard. Speakers from all over the country, the best of the best, came here on this stage and then you're going to be thumbing through the, the different speakers. You're going to think to yourself, how, how can I possibly remember my favorite speaker? I want to help you. His name is Mark J. Lindquist. Say it with me now, Lindquist, one, two, three. Lindquist. You're gonna say, oh, that's right, Lindquist. He did look like a good Swede.
Awesome.